from where we left off. The Wham Sutter Wolf by Annie Pruel. <laughs> that night, rolled up in his sleeping bag, he heard the nearby yip and yodel of coyotes, but near morning, the 5 a.m. light, milky in the windows. He heard deeper howling. Someone's dog, he supposed, and he got up to start the day. He had a hundred things to do in Rollins, the nearest town with real stores. There was another trailer near the turnoff, obviously occupied, as there was a truck in front, clothes flapping on the line. Around this structure was a moat of automotive junk, horse trailers, oil barrels, and a fiberglass boat with a hole in one side. A pile of fence posts lay half in the driveway, and tire marks veering around them showed that they had been there for a long time. Pink-stemmed weeds choked the background. The owners had dogs, and he supposed they were the source of the pre-dawn howling. After a few days, he realized there was a third single wide. About a mile farther out in the desert, he walked to it one day, past the hulk of an ancient truck with solid tires, faded lettering on the door that read J.O. Sheep Company. In the distance, he could hear a drill rig. This trailer was in ruins, broken back because its west end had slipped off the cinder block supports. All the windows had been shot out. He went inside. The floor, the floor groaned and moved, and something rat-like whisked into a hole near the floor. Sand-filled rags and a tiny sneaker lay under a table. No chairs, small heaps of dried grass, and scat pellets laid everywhere. He sneezed at the strong, musky smell. Pack rats, he said aloud. He opened the cupboard doors. In the tiny bedroom, a yellowed newspaper story, dated 1973, was tacked to the wall. It told of several families who had bought land south of Wham Sutter from a fly-by-night development company. In the story, one of the buyers was quoted as saying, This is our dream come true to own our own ranch. We're the new pioneers. This passage had been underlined with red crayon, a line that went into the margin and attached to the words, Dad says in the same red crayon, but the story reported townspeople said the pioneers would never make it through a single winter and no crops would grow in the desert. The accompanying photograph showed a girl about six sitting on the steps of the trailer after a hard look. Buddy thought it might be the trailer he was renting. But it was the next door trailer that became the focus of his attention. On the first weekend, while he was cleaning trash out from under his place, something bit him and his arm swelled to the size of a telephone pole. At the Rollins emergency room, they thought it might have been a rattlesnake, and after anti-venom and tetanus shots, ordered a week's rest. No activity, no reaching under dark trailers or beds. He felt plenty sick. Recuperating, he watched his neighbors. On sunny days, a small boy play fought with a plastic gun in the driveway while a woman in a striped shirt, the same shirt day after day, sat on the steps and smoked cigarettes. A baby crawled in the dirt. The wind blew the woman's long orange hair. She looked a little familiar, as did all fat, fair women, perhaps because that was his mother's physical type. He had dubbed her Fat Wife. <clears throat> During weekdays, there was no vehicle in the yard until evening. In the mornings, the rumble of a diesel woke him before daylight. The neighbor worked hard and long at something. On the weekends, a very old power wagon arrived, and the driver, a huge bearded lug dressed in sagging jeans, a deerskin shirt with fringe, and a wrecked hat disappeared inside the trailer for, <coughs> for hours. 
The man, he thought of him as Big Boy, seemed to be a bow hunter as sometimes in the afternoons he and his hard-working father, he and the hard-working father of the children, this was old dad, would come out and shoot arrows at a hail bay, at a, <laughs> at a hay bale transformed to prey and when they tied on a plastic deer's head. Old Dad looked familiar too, but he couldn't say how or why. He guessed Big Boy was Old Dad's pal or maybe brother-in-law. After the shooting matches, Old Dad fired up the barbecue and Big Boy cooked something on the grill. Buddy could see him turning meat with his hunting knife. So far, so good. But then their dogs began coming around. He had a trash bag of garbage in the jeep to drop at the dump on his next trip to town, but was disagreeably surprised one morning to see a dog leap out of the vehicle with a slice of moldy bread in its jaws. Trash, coffee grounds, bacon grease, plastic wrappers were all over the jeep, and it took him a long time to clean the vehicle. When he was done, he walked over to their trailer. <clears throat> Old Dad had built a plywood entryway with three steps and a handrail. Next to the entryway was a scrap wood lean-to with a basketball hoop. In the center post, milk crates of automotive parts lined up on the ground. Fat wife opened the door. The smell of cigarette smoke came with her. Yeah, she said, lighting another. Hi, I'm your neighbor, Buddy Millar. Uh, I'm having a little problem with your dog's dog, the, the brown one. Two were black and one was brown, all of indeterminate breed. Buddy Millar, I knew there was something. I told Race you looked familiar. He stared at her. The frizzled red hair showed dark at the roots and the long ends straggled across her shoulders like a damp raffia. The finer strands caught in the fleece fabric of the grimy anorak she wore. Her face was so oily it seemed meddled. Behind he, her he could see a brown chair, the floor littered with clothing and toys. I'm Sherry, Sherry Beast, back in high school. Sherry Wham, now me and Race Wham got married. Slowly it came to him, the high school bully, Race Wham, had dropped out in 10th grade. Wham had been a vicious sociopath. Cherry Beast, the overweight slut whose insecurity made her an easy sexual conquest, had disappeared around the same time. Come on in, have a cup of coffee. There was a highway of festering pimples alongside her nose. She cleared a path in the debris by kicking toys left and right. Reluctantly, he went inside. It stank of cigarettes, garbage, and feces. The television set stuttered colors. What are you doing down here, he asked, taking shallow breaths. Race is working for Halliburton now. He used to work for a drilling outfit, but the well froze and there was a blowout and it kind of hurt him. He had a concussion last year and I work uh, Fridays in the school cafeteria. He understood from the tone that in her voice that she considered the cafeteria job a career. Barbette's in school, second grade, and, and that's Vernon Clarence. She pointed at the dull-faced boy of four or five holding a box of Cracker Jacks. And that's the baby, Lie. The diaper-clad baby was crawling towards them and his sticky fingers furred with lint and clutching a tiny red car that Buddy recognized as an Aston Martin. The kid, clinging to Buddy's knee, clawed himself upright and thrust the toy at him. Claw, said the child. Yes, it's a nice car, said Buddy. In the room beyond, he could see a bed heaped with grimy blankets. Caw! 
cherry reheated stale coffee in a saucepan, poured the pungent liquid into mugs, emblazoned go pokes, set one before him. She did not proffer milk nor sugar. She sat down at the table and blew on her coffee. And we're expecting the next one in December, <clears throat> a week before Christmas. It's hard on a kid to have a birthday that close at Christmas, but you sure don't think of that when you're doing it. She had a spit-filled way of talking. The baby was staring at Buddy with a savage intensity as though he was going to utter a great scientific truth that had never been known. His face reddened and the vein in his forehead stood out. He grunted and with an explosive burst filled his diaper. While Cherry changed him on the kitchen table less than 18 inches from Buddy's coffee cup, he looked around so to avoid watching her mop at Lies besmeared buttocks. <clears throat> on the ground, on the floor, several feathers were stuck in a coagulated blob. Wads of stepped on gum appeared as archipelagos in, in a mud colored sea, while bits of popcorn, string ends, torn paper, a crushed McDonald's cup, candy wrappers made up the flotsam. An electric wall heater stuck out into the room. On top of it were three coffee mugs, two beer cans, several brimming ashtrays, tiny plastic fox, and a prescription bottle. Through the amber plastic of the bottle, he could see the dark forms of capsules. There was a sudden plop, and Sherry threw the loaded diaper into an open pail already seething with banana peels, coffee grounds, and prehistoric diapers. The older child, Vernon Clarence, edged along the sofa towards the wall heater. His small hands grasped a beer can and shook it. He dropped it on the floor and tried the other, which responded with a promising slosh. He drank the dregs, warm beer running down his chin and soaking his pajama top. Buddy wondered if he should mention this to Sherry, that the kid was drinking beer, decided against it. The freshly emptied can rolled under the sofa. Sherry suddenly got up, lunged for the cupboard, and retrieved a package. She shook several small, bright pink cakes bristling with shredded coconut onto a chipped saucer. Go on, take one! She held the saucer in front of his face as Lie had held the toy car. He took one, a coconut point stuck into his finger like a staple. He put the cake on the table. Lyle seized it and mumbled, Caw! as he gummed the confection. From across the room, Vernon Clarence started to bawl, pointing eloquently at Lie, whose face was crowded by the pink mass. Here you go, catch, shouted Sherry, hurling a cake at the child. It, it hit an ashtray on the coffee table and sent butts and ash flying. I've got to get going, said Buddy, rising. I just wanted to mention about the dog's uh, dog and introduce myself. Well, I'm thrilled, said Sherry. I always had a big crush on you in high school. All the girls thought you was cute. Race will just about pass out when I tell them who our new neighbor is. She snapped a cigarette from the package on the table. Say hello to him for me, said Bud Buddy, struggling with the door latch, which was some devious child-proof design. He glanced around the room as he backed out. <clears throat> the fastidious Vernon Clarence was picking a cigarette butt from his confectionery prize. Buddy's trailer seemed a cozy haven in contrast with the whams. And he quickly made his bed and washed the dishes, lest he become like them. And we'll leave it there. My voice <coughs> a little messed up today. Some kind of crud going around at work. I think I'll. I think I'll live. Thanks for watching.